Hello. Uh, so my name is James Worrell, and I'm going to talk to you today about algebraic and semi-algebraic program invariants. This is joint work with uh, my collaborators, Shal Almavor, Dmitry Chistikov, Ehud Hrushovsky, uh, Nathaniel Fajakov, Angel Le Fauchou, Joel Wacknin, and Amari Pouli. Before starting, I'd like to thank the uh, program committee and the organizers of the conference for giving me a, a chance to uh, talk about this subject uh, today. So let me start with a, um, an excerpt from uh, a paper of uh, Bob Floyd, Assigning Meanings to Programs, so a well-known paper from over 50 years ago. And uh, in this part of the paper, he's presenting a program and the syntax is given by a flowchart and the semantics is given by what he calls an interpretation. And what that is, is it assigns to every edge in the flowchart um, a proposition involving the program variables. And the idea is that this proposition should be true every time that edge is traversed in an execution of the program. So, uh, so uh, in modern terminology, we'd call such a proposition uh, an invariant. So in this talk, uh, we're going to be interested in uh, primarily in polynomial invariants. So to be concrete, let me give an example of the kind of thing that uh, we have in mind. So here's a simple program with two variables. Uh, and the body of the program is just a loop that uh, continuously executes. And in the loop body, the variables are, are updated by a linear update, which is here represented by matrix multiplication. And probably, well, possibly you can guess already what the program is doing, but if I print out the first few values of the uh, uh, variables as the loop unfolds, then that gives a further clue. And um, perhaps now you can see that um, uh, this program is computing the Fibonacci uh, sequence. And the question that we want to ask is, well, uh, are there any uh, non-trivial in polynomial invariants for this program? So what we mean here is a polynomial equality, some polynomial relationship that holds among the loop variables and, and no other variables, so between X and Y here. Okay, so this is, uh, to my mind, not uh, clear just by looking at the program, and uh, you might want to think geometrically. So let me put as these blue dots the um, reachable program states that I've drawn above. And the question about invariant is essentially asking, is there some algebraic curve, some curve defined by a polynomial equation in which all these blue dots sit? So in fact, there is, and here's the curve, and the equation of the curve is given below. So um, uh, by this polynomial equality at the bottom of the slide. So this is an invariant of the program. Uh, so clearly this, is, this invariant wasn't in the mind of whoever was writing the program, but nevertheless, this is an invariant. And algebraically, the statement that this is an invariant means that we've got an equation, and this equation holds um, for all, uh, uh, all reachable program states. Geometrically, you think of this invariant as, as a set, namely the set of all points x and y that satisfy the equation. And geometrically, the idea is that this set is an over approximation of the reachable set of the program. And moreover, this over approximation is an algebraic set. So an algebraic set is a set that's defined by, as the um, set of solutions of, of a set of polynomial equations, as in the case here. So this is our, our first example of a polynomial invariant. And you can see immediately that such a variant could be useful. So if you give me um, uh, some point in, in, in the plane and I evaluate that invariant, invariant at the point and it's non-zero, then I know instantly that that point is not reachable uh, without having to execute the program. So let me be a bit more precise about what is meant by an invariant. So in some definitions, an invariant is a set or a property that is merely an over approximation of the reachable states of the program. So here the reachable states are the blue dots and the invariant is the red circle. But this is not so useful because it's very hard to check that a given set has this property. So what's more useful in, in practice is the notion of an inductive invariant. So this is a set that contains the initial program states and is preserved by the transition relation of the program and by virtue of that fact includes all the reachable states. So this, is, this is a much more useful notion because it's easier to check that a, a set has that property. Now, uh, kind of one immediate use of invariance, as I uh, uh, hinted before, is to um, certify non-reachability. So we have this quote from a um, paper about invariant synthesis that says, 
The classical approach to the verification of temporal safety properties of programs requires the construction of inductive invariance. Um, automation of this construction is the main challenge in program verification. So the picture is drawn above. So the idea is you've got these uh, reachable states of the program, this set of reachable states S, drawn as blue dots, and you've got a set of error states, bad. And uh, to prove safety of the program, you will need to exhibit an invariant I that includes the reachable set and excludes um, bad. And it should be added that, I mean, invariants can be used also to support liveness proofs and in other um, uh, program verification tasks, but uh, this is one uh, clear and obvious uh, uh, use of invariants. So in this talk, we will be interested, uh, at least in the first part, in polynomial uh, programs and uh, polynomial invariants on them. So this is a, a simple model for program analysis, a very abstract and simple model. So, uh, as far as I know, was introduced by Muller, Ulm, and Seidel in, in 2004. And uh, so in this model, you have a finite set of locations and a finite set of transitions. And um, there are variables, there are program variables. Now, these programs have non-deterministic branching in that the same location can have two transitions that leave it. But these transitions don't have guards, and, and which is to say there are no conditionals in this program. So you could view the non-deterministic branching as an over-approximation of conditional branching. And the assignments to the variables are polynomial, hence the name polynomial program. So if I look at this transition F1, this could in, uh, this, in taking this, there could be an assignment x gets 3x squared y minus 7y. But all assignments are polynomial. And the task of invariant synthesis in this model is to compute all valid poly polynomial relations at each location. So initially, we're going to focus on e equality relations. So a polynomial relation being saying that some polynomial in the program variables is equal to zero, as we had previously in this uh, Fibonacci um, uh, example. And we want to compute all valid relations. So we'll say uh, a little bit later how, you know, what it means to compute all of them. So that's the algebraic view. And geometrically, what we want to compute is a certain over approximation of the reachable set of um, this um, program. And this is a closure in a certain topology. So the over approximation we want to compute is the so-called Zariski closure of the reachable set. Um, so um, think of, we want to over approximate the reachable set by a set which is defined by polynomial equations. So let's just expand a little bit on, on, on this kind of geometric view. So here's my um, affine program. Let's say there are three variables, uh, three program variables. So I can depict the configurations of the program by points in, in, in R3 that sit above each of the locations. So here's my initial point, just the blue dot sitting above one. And then I can see, I can look at the um, reachable states that I get by unfolding the program. So I take F1, I unfold the loop F2, take F3, and I get all these reachable states, S5. And gradually, I unfold the program. And in the limits, um, I get the set of reachable states. So even though this is a very abstract and kind of a simple model, this set can be very complicated, the set of reachable states. So for instance, there's, um, you know, that you can construct a fixed affine program for which membership of a point in this set, this reachable set, is undecidable. So this, is, this can be a, a, a tricky set. But we want to over approximate it by algebraic or polynomial invariants. So what's the picture geometrically is that, well, an algebraic invariant is an over approximation of, of the reachable set that is moreover where, where these sets I1, I2 and I3 are defined by polynomial equality. So it's not drawn very well on the slide, but one should think of these as somehow uh, surfaces in, in, in R3, so defined by polynomial equations. And um, uh, as I said, we're interested specifically in inductive invariants. So inductiveness here says, well, I1, when I apply F1, it should map into I2, et cetera, et cetera. So we want to find um, inductive algebraic invariants. And in fact, there's a canonical such uh, invariant that we want to find, which we'll call the strongest or the smallest invariant. And this exists because algebraic sets are closed under um, arbitrary intersection. So there is a smallest uh, invariant, and um, well, so we'll denote this with the closure, uh, closure notation. So the invariant that we want to compute is, is S1 closure, S2 closure, S3 closure, where, for, uh, for example, S1 closure is the smallest algebraic set 
uh, including S1. So uh, in the, the language of algebraic geometry, this is the Zariski closure of uh, the set S1. Now, the points, uh, I, I mean, a nice fact about this um, minimal um, invariant is de defined like this is it is, um, it is an inductive invariant kind of by, def uh, by, by construction. Uh, so the reachable set, to see this, we, we just observe that the reachable set S1, S2, S3, this is an inductive invariant just um, by the usual um, inductive definition of reachability. So for instance, F1 of S1 is included in S2. And then since F1 is a continuous map, we have the F1 of, F, F1 of S1 closure is included in S2 closure. So therefore the, the Zariski closure inherits this inductive property from the, the, the reachable set. So our computational task then is given an affine program. So algebraically our task is compute all valid polynomial relations that hold at each location. And geometrically, our task is to compute the Zariski closure uh, uh, of the reachable set, which is kind of the extension of, of these polynomial relations. And so this problem was um, posed or formulated in, uh, by uh, Muller, Ullman, Seidel um, back in 2004. Uh, they say it is a challenging open problem whether or not the set of all valid polynomial relations can be computed, not just the ones of some given form. So that is the, the, the problem. And so unfortunately, this problem is undecidable. So there is no algorithm that computes the Zariski closure of the reachable set of a polynomial program. And as I pointed out, that this is a complicated set for which, say, membership is undecidable. So perhaps this is not so surprising. Um, it, the uh, proof here is by reduction from uh, the boundedness problem for reset Petri nets. So um, a reset Petri net is like a, a counter machine where you can increment and decrement ca counters, and, but where counters can't go negative. So you, you can't decrement a zero counter, but, but there are no tests. So it's a test-free model. And the boundedness problem asks, um, uh, is the set of reachable configurations uh, finite or not? And, and in fact, this, this model is decidable for, this, this problem is decidable for Petri nets, but if we add this extra operation of allowing to reset a counter to zero, then the problem becomes undecidable. And it's actually the same, the same phenomenon also observed with the reachability problem. And so very, very briefly, the, the, the idea of this reduction is to simulate a reset Petri net by a polynomial program. So on the one hand, this reset, this Petri net has this um, feature that the counters can't go negative, which a polynomial program doesn't have. But on the other hand, the polynomial program has nonlinear assignments and you can trade one against the other and, and, and perform such a simulation. And then one can show with the right simulation that the, the Petri net is bounded if and only if the Zariski closure of the reachable set of the polynomial program that, that is simulating the Petri net, if and only if that uh, Zariski closure has dimension uh, at most one. So if you can compute the Zariski closure, you can compute the dimension. And the idea is somehow dimension at most one corresponds to boundedness. So the problem is, is, is undecidable, this, this invariant problem. So let's approach uh, uh, from below, as it were, by sim simplifying both the, the model and the class of invariants we're looking for. So let's say, instead of polynomial programs, we look at so-called affine programs, which is just a special case where the assignments now are no longer nonlinear, but they're linear assignments, so affine assignments. And um, moreover, we, we kind of consider a coarser family of invariants where uh, now in each location, we want to compute the set of all linear relationships among, uh, or so that, let me say affine relationships among uh, program variables. And um, geometrically, rather than computing the um, Zariski closure of the uh, reachable set, this corresponds to computing the uh, affine hull of the reachable set in each location. So the, um, uh, uh, so the, the sets defined by conjunctions of affine equalities. And kind of classically, this was shown uh, to be computable and in its relatively straightforward linear algebra uh, in a paper by Michael Carr in, in, um, in 1976. Now, this was, uh, this was uh, investigated and extended a little bit uh, by Muller, Ullman, Seidel in ICALP in 2004, where they showed that there's an algorithm which computes for any given affine program, all its um, polynomial in inductive invariants up to a fixed degree D. So D is fixed a priori and is given as an input to the program and it computes um, 
uh, a representation of all polynomial invariants where the polynomials have degree at most d. So of course the case d equals one would be Carr's algorithm. And in fact, the general case can be somehow reduced to Carr's algorithm by um, a, a kind of linearization trick. So, but that doesn't answer the, 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 the problem. Uh, uh, so so the, this takes us to the main um, uh, uh, results in the first part of this uh, talk, which is that there's an algorithm that computes for any given affine program its strongest algebraic inductive invariant. So remember, this, this is the problem that was undecidable if we have polynomial programs, where we have, but if we now restrict to um, linear assignments, then we, we can uh, compute the strongest algebraic inductive invariant. And so let's just spell out exactly what's going on here. So what this algorithm is computing is that for each location of the program, it computes the set of all polynomial relations among program variables that hold whenever control reaches that location. So the, the previous um, paper that I mentioned by Muller, Orm, and Seidel was, was computing all relations up to de degree D. Now, of course, we need to represent this finitely to, to output it, but we represent this set of relations using a finite basis of polynomial equations. So, um, for instance, a Grodner basis of the ideal of uh, polynomial uh, relations. So geometrically, what the algorithm is computing, as I said, is the smallest algebraic set, set defined by conjunction of uh, linear uh, uh, polynomial equalities, that contains the, the reachable set, so the Zorisky closure of the reachable set. So, okay, so this is the first main result, but I, I want to emphasize here that we're taught the, the notion of invariance are polynomial equalities, so they're, they're, equa they're equational invariants. So just to um, uh, uh, think a little bit about, relate this to kind of uh, other things that are known. So uh, here's a, a paper that appeared uh, one year after Carr's paper. So this is a paper by Mandel and Simon on, uh, on finite semigroups of matrices. So here, the situation is that you are given a, um, a, semi, a finitely generated semigroup of n by n matrices with rational entries. So you're given the, the generators, these square matrices of the same dimension with rational entries. And the question you're trying to decide in this uh, paper is, is the semigroup that's generated by these matrices, so, so the set of all products of the matrices, is that finite? So in fact, it's not hard to show that this, this uh, a finitely generated matrix semigroup can be represented as the reachable set of an affine program. It's a uh, very straightforward exercise. So, uh, it, it, so if one could decide finiteness of the reachable set of an affine program, one would solve this problem. Uh, and in fact, um, uh, this algorithm for computing the Zorowski uh, closure can be seen as a generalization of this result. So in particular, if I have a matrix semigroup, uh, so a semigroup generated by matrices M1 up to MK, this is finite if and only if the Zariski closure is uh, finite because, well, um, the Zariski closure of a finite set is itself because a finite set is algebraic. A finite set can be defined uh, um, by um, polynomial equations. So our previous result on computing the Zariski closure of, um, of the reachable set of affine programs uh, kind of very immediately uh, yields uh, this result. And in fact, some of the ingredients that go into this result uh, are, are, are highly relevant to, to the, the proof of um, uh, um, uh, the result on the previous slide, which I, I'm not at all going to talk about. So let me talk about, uh, instead about some kind of di two directions in which one might want to extend uh, this uh, uh, invariant computation for affine programs. And the first thing is, well, let's try and generalize the model a little to, to some kind of hybrid automaton. So here's an example of a bouncing ball uh, shown at the top. And this ball is traveling along at a constant horizontal velocity and it's, um, it's falling under gravity and periodically it's gonna hit some horizontal slabs and, and when it hits it's going to bounce and be reflected uh, perfectly elastically and this is modeled by a one location affine program with variables t representing time x and y representing the position of the ball and vx and vy representing the horizontal and vertical velocity of the ball and as you see in this uh, this has one transition and the transition corresponds to hitting one of these slabs and what happens when when the transition fires is that the the vertical velocity is is multiplied by minus one so the the, the collision but meanwhile when the um automaton is in the uh, in in the location so this is the extension of the model 
the variables evolve according to linear diff differential equations. So for, in for instance, we have x dot equals vx, so it's traveling horizontally at, um, at the velocity vx, which is constant. And uh, v, uh, vy dot, so the, the derivative of the um, vertical uh, uh, um, velocity is minus g, gravity. So, um, uh, so it's, it's um, subject to, to, to Newton's laws. And um, now this is an extension of the model of affine programs because we have these linear differential equations in the, in the location, but we can adapt our algorithm to compute um, uh, invariance, the, uh, polynomial invariance, invariance defined by polynomial equalities. And for this example, the set of all invariance is generated by the following three. So the, the, the first says that the um, horizontal velocity is constant. The horizontal displacement is equal to the time times the, the, the velocity. And the third uh, equation is the most interesting one that exp expresses conservation of energy. So the leftmost term corresponds to the kinetic energy and this to the change in uh, potential energy. So, um, uh, so this was one direction uh, of extension. So this was published in HSCC that you can compute invariance for these, um, these affine programs with continuous evolution of the, 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 the variables. So another interesting direction in which one can try to expand is, is to consider invariants where uh, more generally than considering polynomial equalities, one considers inequalities. So, and so I give a quote here from um, uh, another one of these classic papers, now from 1978, a paper of uh, Cuzo and Halbwas on um, automatic discovery of linear restraints among variables of a program. And then from this program, their aim was to use inequality relationships to determine at compile time whether the value of an expression is within a specified range and so on. And in, in the kind of context of this talk, what they were doing was they were computing inductive invariants that are defined by conjunctions of um, linear or affine inequalities. So geometrically, their, their invariants were therefore a convex polyhedra. Uh, and yeah, so the you know the question uh, computer invariance of the convex polyhedra for 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 an affine program. So let's um, state some kind of um, results in this direction. We'll, we'll be a bit more general. So let's talk about um, semi-algebraic invariants. So these are invariants that are defined by Boolean com combinations of polynomial uh, inequalities. So you know x squared minus y squared less than or equal to zero. And let me state this, um, so rather than talking about um, uh, affine programs, let me uh, state it in, in essentially an equivalent formulation, that of, of, of uh, matrix semigroups. So the idea is that we're given a finite collection of square matrices, A1 up to AK, all of the same dimension. And we're given an initial state X, uh, this is our, our initial program state, and we're given a semi-algebraic set T, which is uh, our target set, so the set that we want to somehow certify is non-reachable. And the decision problem is, asked, is, to, is to decide whether there exists a semi-algebraic set I, namely the invariant, such that the initial state is in I. Uh, well, this middle bullet point, which is stating that um, I is closed under application of A1 up to AK. So, S here is the semi-group generated by A1 up to AK. So we could say that S acting on I is included in I. So this is inductiveness. And the third condition is that I is disjoint from the target. So, um, so this is a slightly lumbering formulation of the problem. This, problem. this formulation didn't exist before because there was, uh, in, in, this, in the case of algebraic invariance defined by polynomial equalities, there was a canonical object that we were trying to compute, the smallest invariant. Whereas now when we admit the inequality relationship, there's no canonical smallest invariant. But anyway, so the, the fundamental geometric uh, pic picture is, is not so different. We've got the reachable set of states, the blue dots. We've got the target T, and the task is to, to determine whether there exists a, a set I, which is inductive and is semi-algebraic and, um, uh, and separates um, the reachable set from T. So here's a new uh, decision problem. So find semi-algebraic invariants. So unfortunately, this now for um, uh, this problem is undecidable. So as I said, I, I stated it for, for um, 
in the setting of, of, of uh, matrix semigroups, so you have finitely many matrices, but it's essentially equivalent to the form, formulation of affine programs. So this problem is undecidable in general. Uh, there is, uh, well, th let's say that um, there is a positive result uh, uh, related to this. And th this is that the semi-algebraic synthesis problem is decidable if we have a single matrix. So uh, this is slightly underwhelming, but the, let us not forget that the actual corresponding reachability problem here is, is uh, a long-standing open problem. So the reachability problem is I've got a single vector and a single matrix, and I consider the orbit of that vector under the matrix, and I need to decide whether this uh, reaches the target T, some semi-algebraic target. So this is uh, open and apparently a very hard problem. But however, we can solve the, the, the synthesis problem, the semi-algebraic synthesis problem, which by the way, does not solve the reachability problem because it might be that I, I can't reach the target, but there's no uh, invariant from my, my set that certifies that. And the solution here uncovers some nice um, structure of the semi-algebraic invariants in this case. So as I've mentioned, there is no smallest invariant, unlike the case of algebraic invariants, uh, with semi-algebraic invariants, there's no smallest invariants, but there is a kind of the next best thing. So here, here, here's a proposition that uh, comes from this uh, um, paper. The proposition is as follows. So, so given the matrix A and the initial vector X, there is a family of sets CT. Uh, um, so here, here the, 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 the N is the, 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 the number of program variables. So this family is, is uniformly definable uh, in the theory of the reals with exponentiation. So using exponenti exponentiation plus some times. So I should, should say that these are not semi-algebraic sets. They're a bit more general. And they're uniformly definable. So there's a single formula with parameter t that defines these sets. And they have the following uh, uh, desirable properties. So first of all, each ct is an inductive invariant. So it's closed under application of the matrix t. And it contains um, a tail of the orbit, so the, a tail of uh, all but finitely many reachable states, in other words. Every semi-algebraic invariant contains some CT, so for some T. So this is the kind of minimality property. So there's no minimal invariant, no single minimal invariant, but there's some uh, kind of minimal family. And another nice property is that for a semi-algebraic set T, the truth of the statement that there exists a, um, um, a little t such that ct is disjoint from the target, this can be decided unconditionally. So just what is meant by this? Well, uh, whether the first order theory of the reals with exponentiation and plus and times is decidable, that is an open problem. However, it is, was shown by um, uh, McIntyre and Wilkie that the theory is decidable subject to a number theoretic conjecture called Chanel's conjecture. But we don't need to use that in this case at hand. So even though these, this family CT is definable in Rx, in the case at hand we can use other number theoretic results to show that um, the, the truth of this statement is, uh, can be decided unconditionally. And so this idea enables us to prove the, the theorem above. So the idea is if, if there is a semi-algebraic invariant, the way you prove it is, or the way you witness it, is you find one of these sets CT, which is disjoint from T, and you fatten it a bit. So the CT itself is not semi-algebraic, but you fatten it a bit so that it is semi-algebraic, and that gives you a semi-algebraic invariance, and that's um, a, a complete method for finding semi-algebraic invariance. Okay, but again, for the, for the case of a single matrix. I mean, another way you can kind of uh, recover from the undis or recover decidability, as it were, is go back to the original paper of Cousin and Halfwax and say, well, let's look at convex invariants. And in particular, let's look at convex polyhedral invariants. So where the, um, uh, the set defined by the invariants is a convex polyhedron, and we're looking at conjunctions of linear uh, inequalities. Uh, so I should say that the undecidability proof here, this uh, heavily uses non-convexity. And, and, and in fact, this, the, 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 the fact that these are semi-algebraics uh, is, is not so significant. You can make this work for, for polyhedral sets, but as long as you, you allow them to be non-convex. So the non-convexity is the real problem. So this, this brings us to the, the Monio problem. So, um, so, so this is a kind of problem, I guess, has been implicit for a long time, but, but uh, David Monio has, has really kind of ex explicitly stated it. Uh, uh, and this is a, a quote from his paper in um, uh, 2019. 
He says that 40 years of research on convex polyhedral invariants have focused on the one hand on identifying easier subclasses uh, and on the other hand on heuristics for finding general convex polyhedra. So here he's, he's interested in, in, in variants which are convex and polyhedral. But he points out that these heuristics are, however, not guaranteed to find polyhedral inductive invariants when they exist. To the best of our, our knowledge, the existence of polyhedral inductive invariants has never been proved to be undecidable and, well, and never been proved to be decidable either. So uh, this is, a, a, I think, a very interesting open problem. Um, again, so the, to, 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 to properly formulate the problem, you're given an affine program and you want to decide, is there a, an inductive convex polyhedral invariant that avoids a given target uh, set of bad states? So that's kind of one uh, uh, interesting kind of um, uh, research problem, open problem. I mean, more generally, you could, I could say that there's a kind of uh, a huge wealth of work on invariant synthesis, a lot of it in a much more general setting than has been considered here. So considering uh, not just polynomial functions, but uh, things like exponentials and logarithms, and maybe less, um, a bit more pragmatic, so interested in, in practical uh, methods that work for more, more, uh, more realistic classes of programs. And so, I mean, just one uh, small sample of, of this work is a, a paper from a few years ago in, in Popple uh, from um, Kincaid, um, uh, Seifert, Breck and Reps, uh, non-linear reasoning for invariant synthesis. And exactly here, they're, they're looking at a much richer class of, 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 of invariants. And, and so there's a, um, um, a, a lot of work in this direction that I, unfortunately I haven't had a chance to touch on in, in this talk. So I, I should finish there and just say, well, thank you very much for your attention.